Good evening, everybody. Can um, let's see. I see that we have at least sixteen participants, and I'm just going to take a look here. See if I can see. Um, yes, I I see folks have signed in. So, um, good evening, everybody. And welcome to this evening's presentation of the People's Law School. Tonight's topic is understanding benefits and eligibility for Three Squares Vermont, general assistance, Medicaid, and healthcare subsidies. I just want to remind everybody that this evening's presentation is being recorded. Um, the presentation, uh, today's presentation is made possible through a partnership with the Vermont Attorney General's Office, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, the Vermont Institute for Community and International Involvement, and the Caroline Fund, with additional support from the ACLU of Vermont. My name is Bessie Weiss and I am an Assistant Attorney General for the Agency of Human Services. I'm joined tonight by Jessica Duranlo. Ms. Duranlo uh, works at the Economic Services Division of the Department for Children and Families. She is a Food and Nutrition Assistant Administrator and has held this position for the past six months. She has worked for uh, the department uh, providing direct services to Vermonters for the past nine years. Joy, uh, presenting with Jessica is Faye Longo. Faye has more than 10 years of professional experience in the nonprofit and local government sectors. She is currently the Associate Manager of Three Squares Vermont Community Engagement with the Vermont Food Bank, where she works to assure all Vermonters have access to Three Squares Vermont and the many other services and supports that Three Squares can open the door to. She also provides outreach and education, working to dispel myths and counteract stigma. She is a first generation college student who graduated magna cum laude from Southern New Hampshire University and will this year begin her MSW program in the fall. She would like you to know that she is a proud lived expert having firsthand experiences with generational poverty, hunger, trauma, and addiction. Mark Eli is Interim General Assistance Program Director for the General Assistance Program. He's worked for the Economic Services Division of the Department for Children and Families for 11 years and has recently completed a master's degree in public administration at Norwich and is currently enrolled in the Vermont Leadership Institute. Mark would like you to know that he is a native Burlingtonian. Danny Fuoco is a healthcare policy analyst with the Department of Vermont Health Access. She has worked in the Med Medicaid policy unit at the Department of Vermont Health Access for over five years. Sean Sheehan is a senior policy and implementation analyst at the Department of Vermont Health Access. He's held that position for the past two months, but Sean is a DIVA retread uh, who did similar work at DIVA from 2012 through 2019 before hopping over to the Legislative Joint Fiscal Office for a couple of years and then hopping back. So tonight um, we will be taking your questions via chat. Um, you should see a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question, just click there and ask your question. I will be able to see when, que when that question is pending and I will um, provide your questions to the panelists. Uh, we should also, um, we'll also try to uh, give you a little time at the end of each presentation to ask your questions. And at, at that time, if you want to um, use the raise your hand function, I can um, allow you to talk and ask your question. Um, so let me see, I'm just making sure that I go through, I've gone through the, prelim the preliminaries. Um, 
And this evening, we will be starting uh, presentations with um, Faye Longo and Jessica Duranla, who will be presenting on three squares. So take it away. Thanks, Bessie. Thank you. Can you, yeah. can you pull up our presentation, Bessie? And now that's what I will see if I can do. <laughs> I think oh. I, I think I can in just a moment. Do folks see that? Excellent. Um, so as Bessie already said, my name is Faye Longo. I'm the Associate Manager for Three Squares Vermont Community Engagement for the Vermont Food Bank. And I've been in that role for about four years now. Um, I've worked in the nonprofit sector across the state of Vermont ever since I was old enough to work. Um, and I am also a lived expert. Um, this is mine and Jessica's contact information so folks can reach out to us directly. Um, so I'm really, really excited to talk to you all about Three Squares Vermont. Um, Three Squares Vermont is our state's version of what is federally known as SNAP, or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's intended to provide um, as a supplement to an already existing food budget, but service providers like us know that for most people, Three Squares Vermont is their only food budget. Um, three Squares Vermont benefits are usually received on an EBT card, which is also known as an, an electronic benefits transfer card. It's just like a debit card, and you'll sometimes hear Three Squares Vermont called EBT because that's what it comes on. Benefits can also be received as cash for folks over the age of 65 and for folks who are deemed disabled by Social Security who are receiving SSI only regardless of how old they are. Many folks are three squares Vermont eligible and don't know it. You can be three squares Vermont eligible even if you're working or if you're a local business owner, if you're single or have a family, whether you're younger, older, or in between, if you're homeless. Many, many folks are eligible for three squares Vermont. And three squares Vermont is our first and best defense against food insecurity. For every one meal that the Vermont Food Bank provides, Three Squares Vermont provides nine. And those are meals that, that the people receiving them can actually eat. And, and it's their preferred foods. It's, those, it's the foods that meet their nutritional needs that they bought from their local preferred grocery store, co-op or farmer market. Um, Three Squares Vermont lifts folks out of poverty and is only rivaled in its ability to do so by the earned income tax credit. It allows, like I said, it allows people to access the foods they need when they need them from where they prefer to get them. And it provides people the power of choice. So not, not only of the foods they get, but also of where they're getting them from. And that's the definition of food serenity. So finally, when eligible Vermonters sign up and receive their Three Squares Vermont benefit, it not only benefits them, it benefits our whole community. It brings money into our local food economy. It helps our schools offer universal meals. It supports our farmers and small local grocers. It's just an all around win. Next slide, please. Yep, let's see. Oh. So for what and where, where can you use the Three Squares Vermont benefit? Um, so you can use Three Squares Vermont benefits at all, um, at most convenience stores, at farmer's markets um, and grocers stores and food co-ops, participating farmer's markets, any place that SNAP EBT is accepted. Um, and you can use Three Squares benefits to purchase non-taxable food items. This includes things like fruits, veggies, drinks, meats, dairies, shelf-stable food products, breads, and more. Um, 
I always tell people that you can buy a sand, you can't buy a sandwich from the deli, but you can buy all of the fixings and make one yourself. Um, so anything that is non-taxable for food items is eligible for purchase with the Three Squares Vermont benefit. And then next slide, please. Yep, there you go. So what's new with Three Squares Vermont? And um, please just remember that some of these changes are temporary and they might change um, due to COVID times. So right now there's an increase in monthly benefit. Everyone receiving Three Squares Vermont is receiving an increase in the total benefit that they are receiving. Um, there is a state of emergency which allows a maximum allotment to households um, with the same number of folks that could be receiving different amounts. So everyone is receiving at least an additional $95 a month in three squares benefit. Expanded eligibility for college students, most restricted groups um, for, for college students, they now have temporary changes. So we are allowing students who are income eligible and receive a zero EFC, um, which is your estimated family contribution, or if they are eligible for work study with no work requirement at this time, they can be eligible for three squares Vermont. At the moment, the federal pandemic unemployment compensation is not being counted and lump sum payments are not being counted at this time. Um, in the past, we had counted some of this income um, and it was putting folks over income, but now the FPUC is not counted as income. And then we also have introduced this year a three squares in a SNAP program, which is a simplified application process for all household members who are age 60 or are receiving disability benefits. They're not earning income from a job or self-employment. And the review period is for 36 months. Um, and with this comes, no interviews are required for reviews. Next slide, please. And where can you go to access help with Three Squares Vermont? Um, so Economic Services has 12 district offices that maintain, and they maintain a benefit service center. Um, ESD works with 12 Three Squares outreach partners located throughout the state of Vermont. At these locations, you can ask questions, you can receive help completing and submitting applications, both new and review applications are available at the locations. Um, our state employees and our state partner sites are available to help explain notices and requests for verification that you may have received. Um, and then different types of things that our, our state partners do. Um, our areas on aging or council on aging, they specialize in supporting Vermonters age 60 and older. Um, they do have geographic location boundaries and you'll see that the links for the different areas on aging um, is on this slide, which is going to be posted in the group chat. And then our Capstone Community Action Agencies work with Vermonters to meet the needs such of Vermonters um, for food, fuel, utility assistance, housing, Head Start, and they also have geographic boundaries. Um, so the, the link to where you can find your local Capstone or Community Action Agency will also be put into the group chat. And then um, the Vermont Food Bank, as you will hear from Faye in a few minutes, works with all Vermonters throughout the states. They have no geographical boundaries. And just a reminder, all of the agencies here are here to help answer any questions you have or may have about three squares, three squares in a snap. Thanks, Jessica. Um, it can be a bit confusing for folks, um, but the state partners with community organizations like Vermont Food Bank and the Area Agencies on Aging and Capstone Agencies so that we can provide that, 
that direct one-on-one -on -one support and service to people who, who might have questions about Three Squares Vermont, or maybe their situation's a little wonky and they wanna talk it out with somebody. Um, and we value that relationship we have with the state so very much. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little specifically about the Vermont Food Bank because that's who I work for. Um, so Vermont Food Bank, if you didn't know already, has a team of dedicated Three Squares Vermont subject matter experts who can provide, we provide Three Squares Vermont outreach like this. Um, we do eligibility screening, we do application assistance, we do referrals and we follow up with folks. We can be available to answer your questions. We can act as a liaison contacting the economic services division on your behalf if, if that's a need or a want of yours. Um, a big part of what we do though, I did mention referrals, but we also work to assure that the people that were signing up for Three Squares Vermont are also aware of and have access to all the other programs that it opens the door to, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. Um, it's our team's goal and it's our passion to assure that every eligible Vermonter is not only signed up for Three Squares Vermont, but that they are also receiving the most benefit they're entitled to that they're aware of and utilizing all those other services and supports. And we stay in continuous relationship with folks and the communities that we're supporting and serving. Um, part of our goal today is of course, to share information with you all about Three Squares Vermont, answer your questions. Um, if there's a, just a few things that you would take out of this, the two things that I would hope that you would remember is that you can always reach out to the Vermont Food Bank and you can reach out to the state directly too at any time or any other of the um, other community partners if you have questions or you want support. Next slide, please. This is my favorite one. Oh, I get so excited about this one. So Three Squares Vermont ties to a lot of other programs. I like to refer to it as a gateway benefit because once you get Three Squares Vermont, it opens the door to so many other services and supports. Um, and we all know that food insecurity is a sy symptom of a larger problem. Three Squares Vermont opens the door to so many other services and supports like fuel assistance, which is an annual benefit folks receive to pay for fuel to heat their homes. WIC, um, which stands for Women, Infant, and Children, which provides nutritional supports to pregnant women and breastfeeding women and children up to age five. Child care subsidy helps parents cover the cost of early ed and care for their kiddos so they can go to work or school. Um, Three Squares Vermont households who have school age children automatically qualify for free school meals and assistance with things like SAT testing and college application fees. Um, Q-Link, which is amazing. Q-Link provides a free smartphone along with free texting, unlimited data, and 250 free minutes per month. Um, and Lifeline, which is a $14 credit on landline phones. Um, folks who are three squares Vermont eligible are also likely eligible for another Vermont food bank program called Commodity Supplemental Food Program which provides a box of shelf-stable foods to folks over the age of 60. Um, if you are Three Squares Vermont eligible, you also are likely eligible for supports like VSNP, which helps people get their animals um, spayed or neutered. And, you, and Jessica told me about this the other day. I didn't even know this. You also get a discounted Amazon Prime membership. So it's like half your Amazon Prime membership would be half the cost and you can order food and use your EBT card through Amazon. Um, also many cable companies offer discounted internet packages for folks that are receiving free school meals or SSI or Three Squares Vermont. Spectrum Internet is Assist is one of them. Um, Comcast offers internet essentials please reach out to your local cable companies and ask what programs they're offering or contact the Three Squares Vermont team at the food bank or the state. We'd be happy to assist you in finding more information about that. Um, I promise I'm almost done. There's just so much, which is so exciting. Folks can also access Crop Cash. Crop Cash is so cool. With your Three Squares Vermont benefit, you can access 
So you can use up to $10 of your three squares Vermont benefit at participating farmers markets and crop cash doubles that $10, turning it into $20. Um, and three squares Vermont folks can sometimes get discounted um, CSA memberships. And I can never remember what CSA stands for, but um, they're those community garden plots that sometimes you have to pay for or a garden share. Um, and you can use Three Squares Vermont benefits to purchase seeds and starters, which this time of year is just so important and amazing. You could even just grow things in a little, you know, in a little box in your window if you wanted to. So these are just, you know, a dozen or so other reasons why Three Squares Vermont is such a strong and amazing program. Next slide, please. Faye and Jessica, one second. We do have a question. And the question is, how do you determine eligibility? We're about to go into that. How timely. Yes, perfect. Um, do you want me to go through this question? And then if you have additional, ask at the end of this slide. Perfect. All right. So. In order to be eligible for three squares, there is an application process. Um, and you would need to do this for either three squares or three squares in a SNAP. First, you must fill out an application. You can have an application mailed to you, or you can complete one online, or you can stop in at any district office or partner location and pick one up. After you complete the application, you'll need to complete an interview. Um, this can be completed over the, th over the phone through our interview unit. Um, once COVID restrictions are lifted, um, then you can complete an interview in person at one of the 12 ESD offices, or you can um, go to a community partner agency and they can help you complete the interview over the phone. Um, after you complete your interview, you may be asked to provide additional information such as pay stubs, income tax forms, sometimes childcare information, uh, medical expense information, shelter expenses. Uh, this information can be submitted online with the state uploader. Uh, you can take a photo with a cell phone or you can choose a document from your computer and you can upload it right through the uploader website. Um, you can also drop off the documents at a local office or you can mail them in um, to the Application Document Processing Center. All of our requests for verification come with prepaid envelopes so you can send that back in to us. If you're having problems collecting the, the verification that's requested, you can reach out to one of our partner agencies um, and they may be able to help you gather that information and submit it to us. Um, the next part of the application process is income eligibility. Listed on this slide, you'll see the income eligibility guidelines. Uh, your income will be reviewed. And in some cases, you can use medical expenses and, and child care expenses to reduce the amount of income that you've earned. Um, so this is just a guideline that, that we use. Um, after your proof for benefits, you will receive an interim report halfway through your certification period. And then that is a three-page questionnaire. Uh, most of them are yes or no questions and that you'll have to send back into us. And then at the end of your certification period, you'll receive a review application um, that will need to be completed prior to the end of your certification period. And for three squares, you'd have to complete an interview for the new three SNAP program. You do not need to complete the interview. And if you need help with any of this along the way, um, you can reach out to one of our community mm -hmm. partners or you can um, call our, our call center mm -hmm. or you can stop in at an ESD office. We do have a raised hand. Yep. I see um, Ellen Wicklum would like to ask a question. Ellen, I think I have unmuted you. Let me see. 
Maybe not. Let me see. I'm trying to unmute. The joys of our uh, new virtual world. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I guess it might have to go in the chat because, or can you try, Ellen? I see a mic and I've hit allowed to talk. So you, but you can't hear me? Now we can hear you. Okay, um, I'm sorry, my phone's in my pocket and I don't have a question. I must have done that accidentally. Okay, thank you, Ellen. Sorry for the interruption and the drama. Go ahead, Jessica. All right, so if we have no question, just on to the next slide, please. Sorry. Lucy, is that right? That's right. Um, so because Vermont Food Bank provides direct service to people, oftentimes the individuals that we assist will share some of their perspective with us, which is an honor and invaluable for us as well as our, our partners at Economic Services Division. Um, so these are some direct quotes from folks that our team has assisted over the past year talking about, about their three squares benefit you know, and, and what it feels like to use it or um, how it's affected them. And I'm, I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because I know that we are over time. So if you just want to go on to the next one. Um, so there are two slides in here that have very important information. The one that lists community partners that Jessica shared and this one. And I really want folks to know, um, this is the, so there's Jessica's email, my email, and then you can visit any of these websites. The first one will bring you directly to the state website where you can apply through their online application, which is amazing and super helpful. Um, Vermont Food Health also has a lot of food access resources that people can access. And it also has outreach materials for those folks on here who might be interested in spreading the word about the amazing and wonderful Three Squares Vermont program. Um, and then, of course, there's the Vermont Food Bank website where people can go to contact our team directly. That's what the link will bring you to. But you can also look for our network partner agencies and other food access supports um, via our website. Does anyone have any questions? Because if not, I might throw some at Jessica just for the fun of it. Or I could wait till the end. I do not see any questions in the chat. With that, I feel like we could move on to the next presenter since we did go a little over time. And then if there's time at the end, I can, we can throw some questions out. Because I recognize two people might not know what to ask right now. We just shared a ton of information. That was a great presentation. Thank you, Faye and Jessica. Um, at this point, I will ask, I, I will stop sharing my screen and ask um, that um, Mark Eli uh, talk to folks about what he does and general assistance emergency housing. Hello. Everybody hear me okay? Okay. So, Bessie, uh, I know we talked earlier. The Jets did. Um, I'm live in Winooski, and I'm uh, in the flight path of the F-35. They, I don't know whether they were coming or going. So if they were on the way out, they may come back to land. Um, so I am currently the director of the General Assistance Program. I know, Bessie, you mentioned housing. I do. I was going to talk a little bit about, about GA, and we... Uh, as I, as I was going to say, we are the Island of Misfit Toys. Um, Faye mentioned VSNP, and that is, that is actually a GA benefit. So we do a whole, whole bunch of stuff. Um, in a general sense, um, General Assistance is a state-funded crisis abatement program designed to meet the, need, the emergency needs of Vermonters. Um, like I said, the Island of Misfit Toys, there are a lot of emergency needs. We do a lot of benefits. 
Um, we do everything from providing vouchers for spay, spaying and neutering companion animals, which is the VSNP program, um, to housing Vermonters experiencing homelessness, like Bessie mentioned. Um, in addition, we provide assistance to adults with children or adults who are unable to work. Um, we provide vouchers for dental and medical procedures. We provide rental assistance vouchers. We have a whole sort of transi transitional rental assistance program um, that are for, it's for people awaiting uh, more long-term, uh, generally HUD-funded vouchers. Um, we provide transient, we provide assistance to transients. Uh, we provide transportation assistance. So we'll, uh, the way it's written in the rules, we'll, we'll give you a tank of gas or a bus ticket to the border. Um, and we, we fund burials for people who meet eligibility requirements for that program. <clears throat> so we're a primarily state funded program. I mean, I know that's at the moment, that's sort of half true, uh, but in, in a, historically we are a state funded program. Um, so we provide assistance to Vermonters. Um, there are sort of versions of this in other states, but they're all, you know, some are by county. I think uh, during the pandemic in California, Los Angeles has been doing one housing program, but you might find something totally different, you know, in, in another county. Um, various GA benefits have their own eligibility criteria. I know the last presenters were asked about eligibility. Um, I can give you, I'm gonna to try to give you a general overview, but um, there are more specific rules for more for each of the various benefits, um, but they're broken. So eligibility is broken down into two main categories. Uh, there are non-catastrophic benefits and there are catastrophic benefits. Um, non-catastrophic benefits are typically uh, the rental assistance. Um, we provide uh, monthly rent. We provide room rent to relatives and non-relatives. We we pay utilities, we give people a small cash stipend, uh, $2 a day uh, for a single person. Um, so those are what we call non-catastrophic benefits. It's either based on the presence of children in the household or on the applicant's ability to work generally. Um, or there are also other eligibility criteria like work barriers, um, age. It's not quite this simple, but I'm trying to give you the sort of the 10,000 foot view. Um, there are also income limits. There are pretty strict in income limits. They're, they're a lot lower than with the, the Three Squares Vermont program. Um, that operates at about, I think it's 185% of the federal poverty level. Ours are, are much, much lower than that for non-catastrophic assistance. Uh, we generally follow the reach-up rules, um, the income rules in this category. Um, I said in the beginning that uh, children is the presence of children is one of the eligibility criteria uh, in this category. Really, what this benefit is is a bridge to Social Security for adults who are disabled and uh, awaiting a decision. So we most of the households who apply for and receive this benefit are single adults. We're usually paying uh, room rent to a relative or a non-relative. We're giving them fifty-six dollars every twenty-eight days in cash. If they're renting an apartment, we might be paying utilities. But this is capped at a, around $400 a month. Uh, it's more complicated than that. We take into account shelter costs and any income, any resources they have. But it's roughly 400 bucks a month. So that doesn't go very far when you're paying rent, utilities, and <clears throat> cash. Historically, the catas catastrophic eligibility criteria did apply to temporary housing. Um, since the COVID-19 pandemic began, uh, and the GA program began sheltering Vermonters that were living in congregate housing settings like homeless shelters. Um, that aspect of the criteria has been waived. The whole, really the whole temporary housing rules have been thrown out and revamped. Um, historically, applicants must have experienced a catastrophic event to be eligible under catastrophic criteria. That was stuff like a flood, a fire, um, any sort of natural disaster, um, folks fleeing, uh, domestic violence, uh, renters whose apartment was uninhabitable for some reason, you know, like they had black mold or uh, the, the inspector came in and, and said, shut this place down, um, or whose landlord denied them access to their unit. Um, so, you know, sometimes landlords don't want to go through the eviction process and they'll just change the locks uh, in those situations. Those people were eligible under what we call the catastrophic criteria. 
Um, we still apply part of this rule um, to dental and medical vouchers. So people have to have a medical emergency. They have to have exhausted all of their available income and resources. Um, really what we're doing in practice is we're pulling a lot of teeth. Um, we give people eyeglasses occasionally for a last resort program. Uh, we make them jump through a few hoops before they get the eyeglasses. We usually, people end up getting glasses from the Lions Club, um, but we do, we do a fair amount of, of dental vouchers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, DCF has had the ability, had the authority to waive and vary our rules under legislation passed by the Vermont uh, legislature in 2020. The authority to waive or vary, vary rules is in Act 140, Section 13. I know I'm speaking to a law school student, so. Um, which amends Act 91, Section 4. Uh, this was signed on July 6, 2020. We've used this authority to significantly expand the number of Vermonters eligible for temporary housing uh, during the COVID-19 public health crisis. I'm sure you've seen um, Digger has been covering this pretty well. Um, the whole, the idea behind this was to allow Vermonters experiencing homelessness to comply with Phil Scott's Stay Home, Stay Safe directive uh, back in March, 2020. Uh, the program, so GA is a program that's mostly administered by the Economic Services Division of DCF. Uh, Jester Anlow is my colleague, I've known her for a while. Um, we are half of the Department for Children and Families. Uh, some aspects of the program are administered by subcontractors. Uh, we do RFP process, the VSNP program, a lot of that is subcontracted out. Um, we we contract with the Vermont State Housing Authority to provide inspections for the Vermont Rental Subsidy Program. Um, but for the most part, uh, we're doing, we're administering the General Assistance Program. Um, the program is mainly funded through the State General Fund. Um, we historically get a, an annual budget allotment for things like temporary housing. Since um, there was, sorry, historically, there's also been some, a small amount of TANF funding available for emergency assistance benefits. Uh, those benefits have sort of a separate eligibility criteria. It's very similar to general assistance, but in different in some key ways. Uh, the main one being that children need to be in the household. Um, it is a TANF benefit and TANF is the uh, temporary family, so essentially the reach out program. Um, so normally this is a program that's funded through the state general fund, you know, we're, we're it's, in the low millions for temporary housing. Um, now we have been funded, uh, since the COVID started, we are being funded by FEMA reimbursement. That's gonna change this summer, but for right now where we are, everything we spend on COVID housing is funded uh, with FEMA reimbursements. And you know, we are, our old budget is just, it's laughable compared to what we're spending now. Um, the last part I was going to say is general assistance. So GA has been around for a while. Um, we're sort of newly famous, um, but it's been a, a been a thing for a long time. Um, a lot of our rules, I think, date back to the late 1960s. Well, they've been revamped. I shouldn't cast this in such a bad light. The rules have been rewritten many times, but the original rules date back to the late 1960s. Uh, before that, it was a a town level, county level program that was administered by what's called overseers of the poor. Um, but it, the state took over sometime in the late 60s. I, I think it's 1968, don't quote me on that. Um, I can share my screen and show you, uh, oh boy, <laughs> our new digital world. Oh, there it is, sorry, the green button. I'm so used to Teams. In the state we do everything on Teams and I haven't shared a screen on Zoom. I don't think I've done it once this whole time, but it is the big green button at the bottom. Um, I can share my screen and show you uh, what an application looks like and what our worksheet looks like. If if anyone's interested in that, do that real quick. Also, Mark, we do have one question, and sure. that question is: How does somebody access Section Eight? That is a good question. Um, we, so ESD does not administer Section 8 vouchers. I think 
the best way to uh, get that rolling is to talk to your local housing authority or the Vermont State Housing Authority. You could probably reach out to community organizations like COTS or any of the uh, Brock or the local community organizations like CBOEO could probably be helpful as well. I thought I heard a jet for a second, but it is just a, uh, just a regular plane coming in for landing, so we're good. Um, I think if I share the application, it will sort of, I want to, I want to show folks what, what the program used to look like. So here we go. So I think this is working. Please tell me if it's not. Um, this is the old, well, it's not, we, we still use it. It's the general assistance application. Um, the benefits here would also include housing. This is actually kind of a draft copy. So normally housing would be right here. Um, we're at, you see the uh, section here for household information. Uh, we're looking for the name of the person, the applicant, anybody who's applying with them. Um, this is where in this section, the employment information section sort of, sort of gets into the eligibility of the program. So we're, we're looking for the person's usual application or occupation. Um, have they been working? So we're asking really, is this person able to work? Have they been working recently? Um, have you been offered a job in the past 30 days? Uh, there are some employment requirements. So there are requirements to accept suitable employment if it's ordered, offered for some GA benefits. And then this last question here, do you have a medical condition that prevents working or looking for work? This is the eligibility criteria that probably, I don't have a number, but a, a very high percentage of our non-catastrophic eligibility is based on this question here. Um, this section here is for resources. So it is a, an empty pockets program, as we say. Um, any resources that an applicant has are counted against the amount of benefits they can receive. And then here we're looking for the applicant's income information. We evaluate the last 30 days of income according to a pretty strict, um, pretty low payment standard. Um, and then the bottom here, we're looking for the landlord's information in case we have to pay rent. This is our um, worksheet. So this is sort of what we use to determine the eligibility. And this is where we get into the income eligibility. We use the basic needs standard, the reach up basic needs standard for a household of their household size. I know off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure for a household of one, that is $585. We add the shelter standard. So in um, Chittenden County, that's $450. In the rest of the state, it's $400. That total is multiplied by 49.6%. It's called the rateable reduction. What's left is the amount of benefits we're able to grant. Off that comes any resources that are available, any income in the last 30 days. And then this stuff is pretty boring. This is just their income and expenditures. This is internal benefits we granted or if we denied and the reason. So now I go to, oh. This is our old, uh, I keep saying old, I'm sorry. I'm so wrapped up in the housing world. These rules are still fully functional, operational. They are, I guess in some respect, old, but they are our current rules. Some of these have been waived under our Act 140 <clears throat> authority um, for temporary housing, but the rest of them are very much in effect. Um, I'm not gonna go through the rules, obviously, with you, but suffice to say, we have a pretty long rule book. It's 111 pages. Um, this covers all of it, um, and it is posted online. These are, by comparison, these are our current temporary housing rules, also posted online. Uh, as you can see, these rules on June 30th, 2021, 2021, but there are 12 of them. You got to be a homeless Vermonter. You got to live in Vermont. We apply the definitions of from our old rules. You got to be a U.S. citizen or legal alien. You got to be living in Vermont temporary, um, voluntarily and not for a temporary purpose. So you can't, you know, we're, we're not housing people who are here on vacation. 
Uh, we're a shelter first program. Like I said, it's sort of the empty pockets um, emergency aspect of the general assistance program. So if there's shelter space available, you got to take the shelter space. You couldn't have voluntarily left the place you stayed. We do have income limits. So now for temporary housing, we are using 185% of the touch of poverty level, which is the uh, three squares. Well, one of the three squares income limits. We have a resource limit of $2,250 for the household. Mark, um, I'm are, sorry, uh, can I ask a quick question? They go ahead. Um, due to the pandemic, the income guideline for access to GA is currently increased, but normally you mentioned it was lower, but you, I don't, I, if you said it, I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. Normally, so the norm, it's, there's, it's, you can't really, there's not one number that you can pin down. It's that equation where we take the reach up basic needs standard plus the shelter standard. And then we multiply that by the rate of a reduction. That was never used for temporary housing. That is for non-catastrophic uh, general assistance benefits. Temporary housing under the 2600 rules was uh, a catastrophic benefit. So applicants had to expend all available resources, but there was not an income limit per se. Um, Mark, um, yep. I am going to need to ask if you can try to wrap up in the next yep. few minutes. We're done actually. So uh, like I said, we went from 111 pages here to two pages of rules, 12 of them in total. Uh, number eight is the resources. We're asking that people work with uh, case management. There's a lot of federal money for rental assistance. We want to connect people with that. Um, we house applicants together if they ask. And there is a period of ineligibility for certain behavioral issues. And with that, I'm done. All yours, Bessie. Thanks very much, Mark. I'll just, uh, no, does not look like we have any more questions right now. So with that, I will turn it over to Danny Fuoco. Let me unmute myself here. Um, and Bessie, are you able to pull up the slides or would you like me to do that? If you could do that, that would be great. Sure. Um, let me share this. Can you see this? Ooh. Not yet. Okay. Let me um, figure out what just happened here. See. Are you able to see it now? I've been going through my own screens here. Um, Aha. Uh -huh. How am I doing now? <laughs> I think you're doing well now. All right, thank you. <laughs> Also not used to um, not used to uh, Zoom. So um, please let me know if the slides are working and if they're not, just feel free to interrupt me, any panelists. Um, so my name is Danny Fiacco. I am a policy analyst in the Department of Vermont Health Access. Um, I work in healthcare policy. Um, I have a master's in public administration from the University of Vermont. I wanted to plug that since I forgot it in the bio. Um, I'm going to talk about Medicaid today. Um, so just really going over the basics, what is Medicaid? Um, Medicaid is a public health insurance program um, for people with low income, for people with disabilities. Um, every state operates its own Medicaid program within broad federal rules and guidelines. Um, some folks sometimes mistake it with Medicare. Um, Medicaid and Medicare are both programs that were created by a federal law 
Um, Medicare is specifically for folks who are 65 and older or who have been determined disabled by Social Security Administration. And Medicaid is more of a federal state partnership pro public health insurance program um, that is designed to provide health care coverage for um, individuals and families who are generally low income. Um, and there's a lot of terms that get tossed around in Vermont. Medicaid is sometimes called by other names. Um, one is Green Mountain Care, which is like the umbrella name of all the state sponsored health care programs in Vermont. And if you have Medicaid, it's going to be the name on the card you get. Um, it says Green Mountain Care Card, but um, it could be different programs. It might be full Medicaid, or it could mean that you have um, a pharmacy assistance program coverage, depending on who you are, what you applied for, and um, what you were granted. Another name that you might hear is Dr. Dinosaur. Uh, Dr. Dinosaur refers to Medicaid for children under age 19 and pregnant people. Um, and who can get Medicaid? Uh, like I said, it's folks with low income. Um, an example of this would be if you are an adult. Yeah. Excuse me, I'm sorry, but the slides that we're seeing are, we're just seeing the Medicaid in Vermont and it has your name. Ah, okay, so it's not moving for you. Interesting. If, if you hit F5, I think it should switch into presentation mode. Sorry, Sean, it doesn't seem to be doing it. I'm not sure, what, I have a split screen situation going on, so I'm not sure. My screens look different. I'm so sorry about that. And I apologize too. I, I'm struggling a little bit in the Zoom environment. Yeah. I can I can try to um, to um, pull it up, Danny, and um, I guess I would encourage you. Oh, it's working now. Okay. Yeah, Great. I'm not in the slide setting. Is that okay, folks? The slide show setting. It's Maybe good. It'll work better. <laughs> Um, thank you for the interruption. So uh, let me see. So folks with low income specific categories of eligibility um, is what Medicaid looks at when they get your application. Um, perhaps you are a parent or a caretaker or relative of a minor child. Um, you could be a child, a pregnant person, um, a person with a disability, are you 65 and older, um, or are you a general adult? Um, between the ages of 19 and 64. Um, for example, the income threshold right now for an adult who's a household of one um, would be uh, about $1,481.70 a month um, would be the income standard or limit for that general adult with a household of one. Um, that's not gross income, that's something called modified adjusted gross income. Um, and there's a whole methodology for how um, your income can be determined. If you're 65 and older, or you have a disability, or maybe some other special category of eligibility, there may be a different way in which your income is calculated. So the rules can get pretty complex. Um, and I've left them here as kind of a general overview. And one thing I wanted to mention too, is if you receive um, SSI, so you have um, supplemental security income, I believe, from the Social Security Administration. You are deemed eligible for Medicaid. No matter what state you go to, you get, you get SSI, you get Medicaid. They go hand in hand. Um, so that is something that's helpful to know if you ever leave the state of Vermont. Um, because another thing is that you have to be a Vermont resident to get Medicaid in Vermont. Um, if you move to another state, you would have to apply in that state and qualify under their eligibility standards. Um, and another important thing to know is to get Medicaid that you have to be a US citizen or national or have something called qualified immigration status. Um, and there are federal rules about immigration status for Medicaid. Um, you, if you're a green card holder, you may be eligible. 
um, qualified non-citizens are eligible, and this might be someone who's um, a refugee or has been granted asylum. Um, in Vermont, um, Vermont has chosen to provide Medicaid to um, pregnant people and people under age 21 who are lawfully present. Um, an example of an immigration status that might be considered lawfully present is someone who has um, applied for asylum, but not yet been granted asylum, um, and has had their application pending for at least 180 days, or has been granted a work authorization. Um, there is a five-year waiting period for some qualified non-citizens. So if you're a green card holder um, and you just became a green card holder, um, you may need to wait five years in order to be eligible for Medicaid. Um, but you could be eligible for um, other financial assistance and getting health insurance through Vermont Health Connect, which I think is something Sean's going to talk about um, in a minute. But um, you would have a five-year waiting period for Medicaid. But there are categories of folks who are exempt from waiting five years. If you um, are a lawfully present child under the age of 21, if you become pregnant, um, or if you have a certain humanitarian status, such as refugees, asylees, um, or victims of trafficking, um, those folks are exempt from what we call the five-year bar. And let me make sure I'm moving the slides right here. So how much does Medicaid cost? Well, right now it doesn't cost anything <laughs> because we're in a public health emergency. Um, and all cost sharing is suspended. But if COVID wasn't happening or when the public health emergency ends, um, normally there are premiums for children um, who are above 195% of the federal poverty level. And I have them broken out here. Um, they're, they go by family per month. So if you, um, if you have one child, you, you are at 200% of the poverty level, you would pay $15 a month. If you have three children and you're at 200% of the poverty level, you'd pay $15 a month. Um, v Farm is a state pharmacy assistance program that's specifically for people with Medicare drug plans. It provides wraparound pharmacy coverage um, for those folks. These premiums are charged per person per month. Um, and there's different levels of assistance with VFARM. Um, so those are the two programs that have premiums. Um, if you are an adult, 21 and older, and you're not pregnant, um, you might be charged copays when we're not in a public health emergency for prescription drugs, dental, or an out outpatient hospital visit. And none of those copays are more than $3. Um, so for the most part, um, Medicaid is no cost. And then what kind of benefits does Medicaid offer is comprehensive healthcare coverage. You've got hospital, um, medical doctor, um, laboratory imaging, there's dental coverage, um, which is more limited if you're an adult over the age of 21, covers prescription drugs. If you don't have a car um, or you don't have access to transportation, um, you can book a ride uh, and Medicaid will pay for that ride. Um, and an important thing to know is if you have Medicaid and other health insurance, such as Medicare, or maybe you have a Blue Cross plan, um, Medicaid will, is the payer of last resort. And that means that um, your healthcare provider will bill your other insurance first, um, and Medicaid will pay second. Annie, is it possible for people to be receiving Medicare and Medicaid? Sure is. Um, so some folks, you might be eligible for Medicare. You might also be um, very low income and you can get both Medicare and Medicaid. And that would essentially take care of um, your Medicare premiums um, and all of your Medicare cost sharing. Um, and then what you would have left is the prescription drug co-pays that would be um, charged under the low income subsidy program, which is a social security program. Um, but that would be your only out of pocket cost if you are what we call dual eligible, which is on Medicare and Medicaid. And I just uh, have one more yeah. question too. 
I'm sorry because I'm no, a you're good. facilitator. It won't let me enter my questions in the Q and A. <laughs> um, my other question is: Is it true that, for instance, if there's um, a family of two, there's a mom and a child, the child could be Dr. Dinosaur eligible, even if the parent is working and not Medicaid eligible, right? Yes, because there are many different income limits depending on who you are. Um, and it's possible that depending on who the child's, if the child has a parent that's not living in the household, um, their, their household for Medicaid eligibility could be different than the mother's household for Medicaid eligibility. Um, so it gets, it gets pretty, uh, pretty complicated. Um, the income limit for eligibility for children is much higher than adults. Um, so sometimes we see that, you know, um, well, the children are just on Dr. Dinosaur, particularly if they fall into um, one of the higher incomes that has a premium, that would have a premium absent the public health emergency. Um, and feel free to keep interrupting with great questions. Um, so these are some Medicaid services by federal category, just to give you a sense of um, what is required on a federal level. These are ma the mandatory categories or what um, is required to be covered by Medicaid in every state. Um, there's a lot of acronyms here. The one I just want to call out quickly is something called EPSDT. This is Early and Periodic Screening, Diagnostic, and Treatment. Um, this is a standard that basically says that um, it's important to provide health care to children. Um, and I'm not particular, I'm not the most foremost expert of EPSDT in the state, but um, it's saying that if, you know, if kids need this treatment um, to correct or ameliorate a condition, um, then Medicaid needs to cover it. Um, and this is just really important in terms of uh, making sure that uh, children, which is defined as people under the age of 21, um, are getting all of the services that they need that are really medically necessary. Um, even if the state doesn't choose to provide that category of service. Um, and so you'll see that these optional categories of service, some of them seem like nice additions. Some of them um, sound like something that's surprising to find in an optional category of service, such as prescription drugs. Um, but these are all optional categories of service that's provided in Vermont. Um, there's limits on eyeglasses and dental for um, adults. Um, and, but for the most part, um, these are all, you know, um, comprehensive services that are offered and there's more that could than could fit on this slide. Um, but how do you apply? There's lots of ways to apply. Um, you can apply online, you can apply by phone, you can fill out a paper application and mail it in. Um, you can also get help from a certified assister. Um, and there is a link, I think on my next slide, um, that shows you how to find an assister by county. Um, and they are very trained and very, very helpful if you have a complicated healthcare situation or some questions. Um, and let's see. So we've got a lot of additional resources here. Um, and I'm not sure, Bessie, if we're um, able to, um, I know this is getting posted, I suppose. I don't know if we have a way to put links um, Yes, we're, we're definitely gonna um, post um, the presentations, we'll be able to make them available at, at the AGO. Um, and I'll, um, I'll share, I think I'll be able to share a, a, a um, an email at the end, or uh, I'll make sure our, my email, I'll give people my email and make sure that they can uh, access them through me. Um, we do have one question. Sure. Um, oh, two questions. Uh, what does lawfully present mean? Is asylum, what if, a, I, get, I think it's, is asylum request has been filed but not determined? 
What about if it's not, not yet filed? So if you haven't filed your request for asylum, um, you wouldn't meet the criteria for lawfully present that's in the Medicaid rules. Um, the Medicaid rules say that if you um, have an application pending for asylum and you have been granted a work authorization, and I'm not sure if it's the, the Department of Homeland Security or who, who, who would be granting the work authorization, but the, the federal agency that would do so, um, then you become eligible for Medicaid. So you're, if you have an application pending for asylum and you've been granted your work authorization, you become lawfully present for Medicaid purposes. If you have an application pending and you are age 14 and under or under the age of 14, the application has to be pending for at least 180 days under the rule, which is about six months. Um, so there's definitely, these are like very much federal rules. The states don't have a lot of options in terms of um, the rules around immigration status. And there's a lot of specific categories that we have available um, in our rules that talk about who meets a lawfully present status. Um, it might be that you have an application pending for um, other humanitarian statuses. Um, and it also just gets very, very, very specific in immigration law. So it's kind of tricky because I'm not an immigration expert. Um, to go over that, but part of um, the right thing, and I realize, I'm sorry, this is just in the way. Um, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, I wanted to put a plug in here. This is, they are not affiliated with the state. They're a free program, confidential service provided by Vermont Legal Aid. If you, um, if you are an immigrant and you have questions about your specific status and your specific eligibility for Medicaid or other healthcare programs in the state, um, I would encourage you to call their office because they're able to give you one-on-one um, -on -one advice um, about how your immigration status might intersect with the um, eligibility rules for state healthcare programs in general, um, Medicaid and qualified health plans. Um, and unfortunately, you know, when you call Vermont Health Connect or you call um, Green Mountain Care Member Services, they can give you the information um, about what the rules say about immigration status, but it's, they aren't able to provide advice for you. Um, so if, you, if you're comfortable, I would encourage you to call the Office of the Healthcare Advocate for specific immigration status questions. Um, and I know that there's another And question. Danny, yes, one, one more question. The other question is, are abortions paid for by any programs? Medicaid covers um, abortions, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. And um, Sean, uh, can you take it away? I can. I will get my uh, screen going there. Hit the share screen button. Um, okay. Great. Well, hopefully everyone can can see that. Thanks for uh, for joining and. Um, with that Danny and I went went back to back. This the the uh, the nice thing in in Vermont. We both work for Dep Department of Vermont Health Access, and which is the state's Medicaid agency. As as Danny was talking about, it also oversees the state's health insurance marketplace. Um, every every state has a health insurance marketplace their own, or or use the, the federal marketplace for the qualified health plans that, that Danny was talking about. In a lot of states, you have to apply. Separately, they're not they're not integrated, um, but because Department of Vermont Health Access oversees both, and it's the one uh, enrollment system through our marketplace, um, Vermont Health Connect, that same number that Danny was showing, um, you can apply. You don't have to do a whole lot of homework before to see if you're going to likely qualify for Medicaid versus subsidized qualified health plans. Um, well, we can figure when you call that, they'll figure it out for you. Um, the big thing I wanted to talk about here, and I, I regret kind of the, with the time I gave a 
one hour long webinar yesterday. I'm gonna to try to keep this one to 10 minutes, but that means is yesterday went into a lot of health insurance literacy terms. Health insurance is complex. Not gonna do that today. <laughs> I wanna to, want to focus on the financial help that's, that's available, but I will point towards some resources if I'm using terms, health insurance terms that you're not, not familiar with. I'm guessing there's a breadth of, of people in this um, session who have used the marketplace before or are familiar with health insurance terms and those who aren't. Uh, the big, the, the American Rescue Plan, actually that was passed in March, had three main provisions um, for, uh, that impact our health insurance marketplace. Number one, people who qualified for tax credits in the past, which, you know, to make their health, uh, qualified health plans cheaper, will get even more money than they did, did in the past, uh, number one, um, for both this year and next year. Number two, there used to be um, an issue of a big benefit cliff. Um, and I should flag too, a lot of the programs that we've heard about tonight are have a much lower income threshold of no, no 185% has been thrown around a lot for Medicaid for children and adults. It's 138% higher for Dr. Dinosaur as Danny talked about, but for, um, for the qualified health plans, it used to be 400% of the federal poverty level, which would be an individual up to about $51,000 or a family of four, about $100,000. But now with the American Rescue Plan, that cap goes, goes away. It used to be that if you were at $50,000, you'd be getting thousands and thousands of dollars in help per year. And if you were at $52,000, you'd get nothing. It was a big, big cliff. That cliff's gone away, it's been replaced by a phase out. And that's the second, second provision, the people with much higher incomes qualify for, for help. Um, the third piece is that if you had, if you qualified for unemployment compensation for at least one week during 2021, um, you'll get much more generous subsidies. Um, so it really would make sense to, um, to apply. Um, and those three provisions are pieces that require system updates. It's one thing for them to be passed in March, another for us to make all the technical um, system implementations that are need, needed. So when you apply, you get that benefit. And that's gonna happen in June. Um, so if you applied today, you'd get a little bit different of a, you'd, you'd be determined on the old, the old system, you, you'll then automatically, um, next month after the system updates, telling you about your, your additional benefits. Um, won't talk as much about the tax credit reconciliation, just hopefully everyone filed their taxes by, what was that, Monday? <laughs> um, um, but basically, usually if people take, if they end up reporting a lower income, having a higher income, you know, pay back some of your tax credits that the, the federal government granted a holiday for the 2020 filing year because of the, 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 the pandemic. Um, the other provision that doesn't directly relate to the Department of Vermont Health Access, but does relate to Vermonters, is that COBRA continuing coverage, which is uh, health insurance you get through a job when you leave your job, if you're laid off or if you leave your job, you can, you can get um, your employer you can, you can pay um, to, to keep your, your health plan, but it's quite expensive because you're, you're picking up the full tab. For six months from April through the end of September, um, the federal government's picking up that full tab if, if people were, were laid off. Um, so that's, that's available as well. Um, one piece I wanted to talk about, I'm guessing there's some people who may be on that already have marketplace plans and wanna know about the extra benefits they'll be getting and how to choose plans. But there may also be people on here, or you may know people who are who are uninsured, um, and maybe they've looked in the past uh, and and saw what subsidies they were eligible for, and said, you know, it still would be too costly. One of the key messages I want you to take away with and help spread the word is don't assume that <laughs> it's the same same landscape. Um, as I mentioned, those are big big changes from the American Rescue Plan, and they really um, it's important to take another take another look. Um, as I, ref as I referenced, there's no longer that benefit cliff. It's a phase out, meaning individuals, people in single plans, up to nearly $95,000 can qualify for financial help. And people in family plans with, with incomes up over a quarter million dollars um, can also qualify for, for tax credits. So, so people who um, are, are el meet, meet the eligibility guidelines and have um, the incomes, you know, obviously we all, no, we live in Vermont. I don't. I don't know too many people from the, the state making, making families making much over 
over that um, we're not Silicon Valley. Um, the other piece I think for people who, you know, choose, we'll get to choosing a plan in a minute, but if you're at the point of thinking, do I go uninsured or do I, do I get a plan? Um, it's important to realize that there, there are zero premium plans that now with the American Rescue Plan, you can qualify for if you're an individual and have an income up to $38,000 per year or a couple with an income of nearly $60,000 per year, you can, you can get a health plan that you don't have to pay any, any premium at all. Um, it's important to underscore, you can only get this financial help if you apply through the marketplace, Vermont Health Connect. Some people apply through directly through there, enroll directly through Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield or MVP Healthcare. Typically, if they, don't, if they didn't qualify for subsidies in the past, they might enroll directly with, with those health insurance companies. Um, it's important that they transfer over and they can transfer over their plan. Everybody should have gotten a, a letter, um, the 7,500 people in the state who, who are enrolled directly through their insurance carrier would have gotten a letter sometime last month with the instructions for transferring their plan over to the marketplace, letting them know that if they had paid any money toward their deductible, that would transfer as well. So there really was no downside in, in transferring their, their plan. Um, we have more work to do getting, getting the word out to people there. A lot of, a lot of people don't open their mail from their, from their insurance companies. <laughs> not, not usually a fun thing to open, but in this case, it's potentially worth a whole lot more money than those uh, you know, $1,400 checks that made such a big deal about in, in, uh, in March as far as the American Rescue Plan. People who buy insurance on their own, um, you know, it'll dwarf those, those payments. Um, and one thing I think to flag here, if you do anything, you know, here the, the plan comparison tool we have available at vermonthealthconnect.gov. You'll see the shopping cart icon. You can, you can click on it. Um, I referenced bronze plans before. We certainly don't give recommendations of what plans to be in and, and one thing to kind of a warning about bronze plans is they can have high out-of-pocket costs, but that's why I prefaced it on this page as far as if your decision or somebody you know is having that decision between do I not get insured at all or do I, you know, buy, do I buy a plan um, with those incomes, you know, $60,000 for a couple, you could, you could get a plan that sure would have some out-of-pocket costs, but um, a lot lower out of pocket costs than if you don't have insurance at all, and if you, you know, have an accident and are potentially on the hook for, you know, six six figures or whatever the case case may be, um, there's really a good opportunity for people to get to get insured. If you click on that plan comparison tool icon, you'll be asked a few questions. It's it's anonymous. You don't have to go through the full um, application just to get this this estimate. You answer um, the ages of people in your in your household. Um, and how many people in your household, whether they can get employer coverage. If, if, if there's affordable employer coverage offered to people in your household, they, they don't qualify for, for subsidies. Just like if you qualify for Medicaid, you can't turn it down and take qualified health plan subsidies and, instead, um, or if you qualify for, for Medicare for that, that matter. Um, you can put in whether you um, have any unemployment benefits, as, as we mentioned, that, that'll give a big bonus for this year, um, and then your expected household income. Once you put that in, um, it'll tell you what you qualify for. So for example, an individual making $25,000 per year would qualify for $662 per month in, in financial help. That's about $100 more than they would have qualified for before the American Rescue Plan. Um, now I get, you may be hearing $662, that's, that's great. That's Eight thousand dollars I get, but <laughs> um, what does it what does it mean? What do I you know? What do I pay? And we get there next. Once you see that subsidy you qualify for, you click to compare plans, and it, it'll allow you to um, go up here to um, sort by by premium if if you like, and um, you sort by by premium. Um, it, it'll it'll show you the plans that here have you know no. No premium, as we mentioned, somebody making $25,000, that's less than $38,000. They can get free premium plans. But in a bad year, if they have all that out of pocket, they could be on the hook for, for $8,400. Um, so you may go back up to the top and, and sort by cost in an average year. And that's going to take somebody um, in your, your age group of your family. And if you put in what your health status was, it'll do an estimate based on 
people of your age and health status. You can leave off health status if you want. It'll just give you the average of people of your, your age. The actual premium and cost of the plan is the same regardless of, of what your age is. Vermont's one of only two states that has full community rating, doesn't. Sean, I've just lost your audio. Still gone? I hear you now. Okay, great. Um, so, so really the, the difference is um, that just that if you're older, you're more likely to need more, um, more health care and you'd have more out-of-pocket costs for that reason. Um, so in this case, somebody sort of by cost in an average year, you could still get a very low premium. In this case, it's less than $4 a month. Um, but instead of having that potential high out-of-pocket costs, um, you're, you're looking at, at much, you know, much lower, less than half of, of what it was before. And if you're healthy, you'd still pay less than 50 bucks for the, for the year. Preventive care is always free. So your annual doctor visits and any preventive care um, comes with all your plans. There's no co-pays for those. If you're somebody who's really interested in risk or what your worst case scenario could be, you could go up to the top and sort by uh, cost in a bad year. And that will give you um, the plans that have the lowest uh, bad year costs. So the, the, the out-of-pocket costs will be lower, lowest here. So you see that that good year, if you don't use coverage, is going to be a little bit higher, um, still under $100. You're paying $7 a month for that premium. The average year is a little bit higher. But you know you have that protection if, if you really you know, get hit by a bus, get cancer, get something really bad that would cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars in care the most you would be in in that case. Um, you, if you want to do more research, you can click on these blue plan names. When you do that, you'll come to a screen that has a lot more details that you can read about. If you have a doctor you regularly see or per other provider, you want to make sure that they're in network, you can click here. It'll take you over to Blue Cross or MVP sites. So you can see what doctors are, are in the, um, the health plan. Um, if there's a certain prescription you take, you can, can click on the plan's drug list. It'll show you um, what the, what the co-pays, what the covered um, drugs are for, you know, for generic care, sp specialized drugs, and, and so forth. Um, there's a lot more options there. I think just to end on, you'll notice, as I referenced at the beginning, the website and phone number is the same as the one Fannie gave, the VermontHealthConnect.gov, or 855-899-9600. Um, they can help either answer questions or you can process your um, application over, over the phone. You can also apply, apply online. Um, as, as Danny mentioned, there are uh, assisters. So if, on the website at VermontHealthConnect.gov, there's a, a find local help button that has um, a link right to that, um, the assister directory that, that Danny links, links to. And there's also a bunch of links there for Health Insurance 101 to explain all the terms that I kind of flew through, <laughs> like premium and out-of-pocket costs and copay and, and, uh, and, and different metal levels and all kinds of things we could talk about all night, but won't keep you any, any longer. You can, you can find them there or, uh, or call for, for more, more information. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Sean. I don't see any questions. And since we are going a little over time, I, um, I think that um, if you could stop sharing your screen, um, I will quickly share mine um, and talk quickly about appeal rights. Um, are folks able to see that? Oops, nope. No. Oh. Let's see. How about now? Good, okay. 
So for most of the benefits tonight, um, you do have a uh, right to uh, appeal if your benefit, if your application for the benefit is denied or if the benefit is um, reduced or ended. Um, the, so that would be that would be true of Medicaid. That would be true of any benefits that you might apply for through the um, Division of Economic, uh, the Department of Economic Services, or the Economic Services Division of the Department of Children and Families. Um, any um, and and many other benefits of the state. This does not apply to. Uh, plans that you, health plans you'd get through Vermont Health Connect. You would go through the particular insurer's um, appeal process. So if your benefit application is denied or a benefit's reduced or uh, terminated, you can ask for a fair hearing. Um, a hearing officer from, um, something called the Human Services Board would hear your appeal. Uh, the hearing officer and the board are independent from the state of, Ver of, of Vermont. Um, you can uh, also have any trusted, you can ask any trusted person to help you with your appeal. And you could qualify for free legal help. How do you get a, uh, ask for a fair hearing? Well, you can uh, request one by um, calling the department that denied or reduced or terminated your benefit. And you simply call them and ask for a fair hearing. Um, they will make sure that that request goes to the Human Services Board. You could also call the board directly and I provide their contact information here. Uh, before you, uh, your hearing, the department would give you and your representative a copy of any of the evidence that they would be presenting. Um, and, uh, and you certainly can bring in your own evidence and witnesses. It sounds pretty scary, but this is um, the uh, process is actually quite informal. Uh, so, you, you know, this is not in a courtroom. Um, this is uh, generally by, the hearing is generally by, fo by phone. Um, and if you would like to seek legal assistance, you should contact Vermont Legal Aid Law Line. You may, um, they may be able to represent you or they may be able to, if they can't uh, represent you in the hearing, they may be able to help talk you through um, the process and, uh, and help you prepare. And I provide that their information here. So um, with that, I am um, going to be, I don't see any questions right now. I wanna thank our presenters. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think this was really great and, and very helpful. Um, and uh, just a couple of little housekeeping. Um, we're, I wanna remind everybody that this presentation will be available on the Attorney General's Office's YouTube and Facebook page. Uh, I will also um, give you, uh, you have my name. My name is Bessie, B-E-S-S-I-E, -S -S uh, Weiss, W-E-I-S-S, you can email me, and that would be bessie.weiss at vermont.gov. If you have, uh, if you think of any questions later, or um, if um, you have trouble finding the PowerPoint at the AGO. Thank you, everybody, um, and have a very nice evening.